So I have a question for you guys. There's two different kinds of people. There are people who are detail-oriented, and there are people who are not detail-oriented. Do you find yourself someone who is focused on the details or not focused on the details? Now, some of you may be saying, well, that depends. Well, guess what? You just answered my question. You're a <laughs> detailed person. Is there anyone who says, yeah, I like to focus on the details? Any detail-oriented individuals? Yeah, my, my wife is like that. Uh, the rest of you, you don't need to raise your hand. You probably weren't going to anyways. <laughs> Because you're thinking, ah, oh, who cares? He gets the picture, right? Uh, just, uh, yeah, th th throw it out. My wife and I, I found when we were married, uh, we really see those two personalities play out in the way that we clean around the house. Because me, uh, as someone who is not necessarily details focused, you can see that in all the typos that show up every week in the bulletin. Uh, as someone who is not details focused, uh, I tend to be a really, really good picker upper. Like if you want someone to uh, clean off the kitchen counter and uh, throw the stuff in the trash and, and maybe fill up the dishwasher, I'm your guy. I, I can pick up uh, the laundry, except for maybe my dirty socks. Those always get left behind. But I'll, I'll pick up some laundry on the floor and throw it in the hamper. That's kind of how I roll around the house. I'm, I'm just more of the general picker-upper. But my wife is the cleaner. You know, I, I may put uh, the, the clothes in the hamper, but she's the one that's cleaning them, that's folding them, and she has a very specific setting on the washing machine that um, this is, you know, this garment has to be here on this setting, and, and this has to be just like that, and no, 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 don't put that in there, that, that doesn't belong in that. She's details focused, and that's a good thing for me, or else I'd be wearing a, a pink uh, shirt underneath <laughs> the, this sweater, uh, other than a white one. Uh, she is a cleaner. She, she will scrub down. She, I, I love the way uh, she cleans. She, she's so details focused. She, she'll look at every nook and cranny in a way that I just wouldn't. I would just throw some things in the trash, fill up the dishwasher, take a step back and go, eh, yeah, this looks pretty good. This is, yeah, this is in good shape, but not to my wife's eyes. And I am thankful for that. And I wish she was up here right now. Maybe, maybe I don't wish that she was up here right now. But you can, uh, you, you can ask her about that, and she's going to nod her head and say, yep, that's exactly how he is. Um, that can show up in a lot of different instances, can it? The details focused. Uh, details do matter. Um, they may matter just in small ways, like how you clean the house, but they can also matter in big ways. I remember one time, uh, even for school, there was a payment sent uh, to seminary that didn't go through for some reason because all the information was right, it was turned in on time, but they put in my uh, the wrong student ID number by one digit. Um, details matter. Details matter when it comes to finances. Uh, details matter when it comes to the upkeep of your vehicle. The cup holders are nice, the shiny wheels are nice, but if you're not taking care of the details, that cup holder isn't gonna get you very far, is it? Um, in the same way, the reason why I bring this up is because what I have noticed in my life as a Christian is I tend to look at my Christian life in the same way that I look at my house, in the sense that I tend to not be very detail-oriented. And what I mean by that is when I look at my Christian life, I will often think to myself, well, have you murdered anyone today? No. Um, you haven't committed adultery. You haven't uh, become addicted to meth. You, you haven't um, started selling uh, drugs on, on the corner of the street. Uh, as long as you haven't done those things, you're in pretty good shape, Stephen. You're, you're doing all right. You're, you're, you're staying away from those really bad sins, and, and you're doing okay. You're, you're hanging in there. But then I'll, I'll go home, and while driving home, I'll just get really angry at someone who cuts me off in front of the road. Uh, or, or I'll just let these thoughts creep into my head that are just really bitter or really angry. And sometimes, have you ever had it where you'll, you'll just start having an argument with a person uh, where they're just totally wrong and you're arguing with them, but you've never actually discussed that with them whatsoever? And, and you're just playing out these thoughts in your head uh, about people and, and things just come up that are just completely fabricated in your mind. And we just allow those small kinds of sins creep up in our life and creep up in our heart. I don't think most people in most churches really have this crisis of um, some of these big elaborate sins that, that we see on TV episodes um, or the kinds of things that, that we read about in magazines. I think most of us were just kind of living somewhat normal lives and I think what we tend to forget is that as Christians, as we're going through this world, we can 
sometimes lose focus on how Satan will allow those small sins to fester in our heart or how God will allow or how Satan will allow uh, the, the, those small things to just kind of swirl in our mind and in our attitude of, of hate or anger or bitterness or frustration. And it's those things that then end up in broken marriages or uh, terrible family systems or uh, people feeling so desperate that uh, they, they, they look for love outside of marriage uh, or, or having affairs or those uh, big dramatic things. It's always a slow fade like that song on the Christian radio goes. It's always a slow fade of starting out with the small things. I think as Christians, I think we need to be more focused on those small sins that we allow to live in our heart and our life because sometimes we think that they're okay and that they're no big deal or that if we focus on the small sins that that makes us legalistic and we don't want to be legalistic so we'll just kind of live our Christian life in broad brush strokes and allow small sin to fester over a long course of time. In Genesis, there's going to be some great examples of small sins that were allowed to fester over a long course of time. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. This is a very special morning for us because in Genesis 37, we're starting the Joseph narrative. We're starting the Joseph story. This is a great, great story. It's true, but the telling of it is just amazing. It's just beautiful. I had a professor, most people don't know that I took Genesis at Moody with a professor other than Dr. McMath. Most people assume I had Dr. McMath for Genesis. I actually had another professor named Dr. Vreeland who was great. I loved having Dr. Vreeland for Genesis. And one of the things I remember about him, this Oregon duck hunter, this uh, great uh, kind of just character kind of guy, um, he would talk about Joseph. He loved Joseph. And one of the things that he would say about the Joseph story is that the Joseph story, it may or may not be one of the best stories ever, but it is certainly, in his opinion, he said, the best telling of a story ever, which is an interesting distinction uh, that Joseph is going to be a great, great uh, set of events that is going to unfold for us in the remainder of Genesis. But it is not just the events that are going to be powerful here. It's going to be the way that Moses in the book of Genesis chooses to tell this story that really makes this special. And so as we look at Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 1, remember what I said just a few minutes ago about small sins that fester. I think there's a real mistake that we make sometimes when we look at Joseph, where we, we read these events that are happening in chapter 37, and, and we think that this just popped out of nowhere on a Tuesday morning. That, that, that the things that we're going to read about or the things we're going to find out about with Joseph and his brothers are just kind of like this explosion of sin and anger that comes out of nowhere. Hopefully through our time in Genesis, you'll be able to see that these things did not come out of nowhere. That this whole time, in the weeks and months leading up to this morning, uh, Moses has kind of been weaving this larger picture. He, he's been weaving this larger narrative of these patterns of small sin that has been happening in this broken family. And now in chapter 37 with Joseph, it's almost like all those small festering sins are all about to come to a head and explode. So that's one of my first encouragements, that everything that we see this morning and in the weeks ahead with Joseph, these are not just new out of the blue sins. This is the product of small festering sins that we've already talked about in the passages before that have never been dealt with and are now just naturally boiling over to the end product. So let's keep that in mind as we look at Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. Now there's something very interesting that's happening in verse 1. It says that Jacob lived in the land of his fathers, sojourning in the land of Canaan. And then let's read the first half of verse 2. And these are the generations of Jacob. Remember what we said last time. Um, the focus on the generations, the, the, the focus on the family line is one of Moses' favorite ways to transition the story. Moses did this with Abraham. Moses did this with the other patriarchs to a small extent where, where, where he loved to focus on um, the, 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 the generations, the lineage of these people, uh, of what brought them to this point. 
And you remember last week we talked about how in chapter 36, we have this very long list of all these descendants of Esau. That's part of what's going on here. Moses is transitioning the story, and we didn't really preach word by word, verse by verse, through all these verses in chapter 36, because you don't really know most of these names. A lot of these names don't show up much anymore throughout the rest of the Bible, but these names would have been important to the Israelites who were reading it. But notice the contrast between Esau's family in chapter 36 and what's about ready to happen in chapter 37. That in chapter 36, Moses goes, okay, here's the family of Esau. He had this guy, then he had that guy, then he had that guy. But now he goes back to Jacob in 37, and he says, and these are the generations of Jacob. What's the next word in your Bible after that? Joseph. Huh. Joseph isn't the oldest. Hmm. We haven't heard. Wait, has Joseph popped up at, at this point? Has he has he killed any giants? Has he uh, um, has he been in any lion's dens? Has anything interesting happened with Joseph up to this point? No. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph. The focus now is going to be on Joseph. And notice what's happening in chapter thirty-seven. Moses isn't just doing the same thing for Jacob that he did with Esau. He's not just going, and Joseph had so-and-so, who had so-and-so, who had so-and-so. No, they are zooming in the lens. They, they, he, Moses is bringing in the focus, not just on the generations of Jacob, but the specific events that are going to happen with these people. We are now kind of on the road, so to speak, to Egypt. We're, we're on the road to the Exodus. This is now the, the, the big transition story where Moses is going to show, this is how we got from there to the land of Canaan, here to Egypt, and exiting out of Egypt into the wilderness and into the promised land. So all of this is just to say that Joseph is incredibly important. I hope that there's any takeaway up to this point is that what's going to be happening spiritually, what's happening in the book of Genesis with Joseph is massively important to the overall book of Genesis. The focus is now going to be on Joseph. And what we're going to see in these first 11 verses is I believe we are going to see three examples of small sins that have festered up to this point, that will continue to fester, and that are soon going to boil over, that are also very common in our lives and in our hearts. So we're going to find three examples of small sins that you're not going to see in some big expose in a podcast or, or, or some big article in a Christian magazine. Small sins that probably at some point, maybe even right now this morning, have existed in each and every one of us. So let's look at what that first sin is. It says that Joseph, being 17 years old, your word might just uh, describe him as a boy, it says, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilya and Zilpah. Remember, those are the two servants uh, that Jacob had children with, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. We'll keep going to verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a robe of many colors. We'll stop there for a second. One of the first sins that I think we see happening here and that I think can very often exist in good, healthy, mature Christians is the sin of arrogance, is the sin of pride. There are some pretty amazing things that are happening here. First off, Joseph is described as a 17-year-old, which in that culture is fairly old. Um, he's, he, he's pretty much considered a man, yet look at how the words describe him. They call him a boy. That's going to be a, a, a little bit of a hint of, of maybe the attitude and the character of Joseph at this point. He's 17 years old. He is very much maturing into an adult. He's pretty much an adult at this point, but he is still described as a boy compared to his brothers. This isn't his brother writing this. This is Moses writing this. If it was the big brother calling him a boy, that would be one thing. But this is Moses in these early verses describing Joseph as a boy. There's also something very interesting that happens here. Your translation may say that he was pasturing the flock with his brothers, but there's something very ambiguous about what's happening in the language there, where it could mean that he's pasturing the flocks with his brothers, but it could also mean, 
And this is not like super advanced Hebrew. If someone like me can notice this, this is, you know, we're worth pointing out. There's an accusative in there which says that it could also be translated that Joseph was pastoring his brothers. I want you to think about that. Not just that he was shepherding the flocks with his brothers, but that he was also shepherding his brothers. This little boy, this little brother in the family, he's out in the fields and he's not just shepherding the sheep, he's also shepherding his brothers. Have you ever had a family member like that? Yeah, I, I think we all have. And if you haven't, guess what? You are that family member. <laughs> Another thing I think we have to notice, this is very interesting with Joseph. The end of verse two, it says that Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, when I grew up, I always assumed that that meant that Joseph was just a tattletale. And that was easy for me to believe because I had two younger brothers and a baby sister. I know what younger siblings do, and younger siblings have a PhD degree in tattling on their older brother. Uh, they, they know how to do that at a very, very high level. And so I just assumed that, hey, Joseph is a goody two-shoes. He's someone who's always doing the right thing, and that's just really annoying. No one likes the guy who's always really good at stuff and always is doing stuff right and details or Oriented, and he's running back to his father, Jacob, telling and tattling about how the big brothers were maybe taking a five minute longer lunch than they were supposed to, or uh, maybe how they were falling asleep on the job. But that's not necessarily what is implied in the original text. The English translation makes it appear like Joseph is giving a report of something bad that has happened to the brothers. But really, the word that's used here, when it's translated in every other instance in the Old Testament, is tall tales, is, is folk tales. Uh, th th this, this idea of a kid coming and lying about how big of a fish he caught. Joseph isn't giving a report about something bad from his brothers. Joseph is literally giving a bad report. He's given a bad report. How could Joseph be such a bad guy? He's uh, he, he's domineering. He's probably, it seems to be suggesting, uh, shepherding over his brothers in, in a way that is arrogant and in a way that is prideful. And in the same way, he is bringing a report to his father that we translate as just a bad report, but in the Hebrew is used as, as a tall tale. It's almost like Joseph is related to someone who knew how to deceive his parents. It's, it's almost like Joseph knows a thing or two about manipulating other people, especially parents, in order to get the better hand of his siblings. Where could Joseph had pers where could have Joseph learned something like that from? From Jacob. Where could have Jacob learned it from? Isaac, and so on and so on. Do you see a pattern that's happening in this family? The thing about families is that we have children and we have grandchildren who take after us. And your bad habits, when we have kids, guess what? They learn those bad habits. I think one of the sins that we see in Joseph at this time in his immaturity, a sin that we usually don't want to point out with Joseph. A lot of times, I grew up with Joseph being pretty much a perfect character in the Bible. Almost like a Jesus, like he really did nothing wrong. I don't think that's how we should understand Joseph early on in this chapter of the story. This is a young man who has allowed arrogance to come into his life, and that has only been uh, established, that's only been brought to the forefront by the fact that not only that, he has this tunic, he has this coat of many colors. I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with grandparents who loved Dolly Parton, and so I grew up learning that a coat of many colors was exactly that, a coat of many colors. I remember all the flannel graphs where Joseph had that cool set of pajamas that I was always really jealous of, that had all the little rainbow stripes on it, Probably not what he had. Probably not truly a coat of many colors, although that would have been so cool. It's probably just more of a tunic that reaches all the way to your hands, that reaches all the way to your feet, and probably has some kind of symbolism of importance in the family, probably some kind of symbolism of authority. But I don't think we really know. If anything, what we know about this tunic is that it really helps us date Genesis and it really legitimizes Genesis as a authentic piece of storytelling that fits into the time in which it claims to be a part of but the first sin that we see here is arrogance. We see here pride. I think many of us as Christians deal with pride in our life. 
where we just assume that we're better than other people. We're better than those people across the street who don't go to church. We're better than those people who vote for that person or who believe in those political mindsets. We're better than that person who has that kind of opinion about COVID. We're just better. We're better, they're worse. There's nothing wrong about liking yourself or being happy for the things that God has given you, but the kind of pride that is sinful is always the kind of pride that lifts yourself up in such a way that it also puts other people down. It's always the kind of pride that leads to hate, which I think is gonna be proven in the following verses. Look with me at what happens next. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him, him being Joseph, more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Up to this point, we've talked about the pride of Joseph, but we also have to talk about the pride of Joseph's brothers. We saw a pretty amazing example of that pride a few sermons ago when we saw Reuben in doing what he did to his father and to his father's wives. That was a very prideful, arrogant thing. Reuben thinking that he deserved his father's wife, thinking that he deserved this place of honor, this place of inheritance from his dad. So he did that terrible thing uh, in a way that was emasculating to his father. There's pride happening on both sides and it is finally coming to a head. It says that they could not speak peacefully to him. They couldn't even say, hey, could you pass the salt without it just boiling over into anger and into hatred. This is a result of pride. This is gonna get even more intense on what's gonna happen in verse five. It says that now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Now I want you to pay attention to how Joseph is telling this dream because he's not just coming into the breakfast table, <sighs> yawning and wiping his eyes and saying, fellas, I had the craziest, most ridiculous dream last night. I'm, I don't even want to tell it to you guys, but you know what? It's just so crazy. You guys are going to have a good laugh. That's not what Joseph is doing. Joseph is going to tell this story like it is the most important, most amazing story that they are ever going to hear. He says, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and... Behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Behold, behold, we've seen some pretty big miracles get described in Genesis up to this point, and not even Moses used that many beholds. I went back and counted. When Jacob was uh, at Bethel and God is coming down this ladder and, and all these angels are coming down to earth, they didn't even use as many beholds as Joseph is using to describe this dream that he had. What does that suggest about how Joseph views himself and how he views this dream? That he is a pretty big deal. Check it out, guys. Behold, there was these other sheaves that were just bowing down to me. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Hmm. So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Going on to verse nine, we see the same thing happen again. It says that then he dreamed another dream. Notice that in previous chapters, God would just speak to Abraham and he'd speak to Isaac and he'd speak to Jacob. God's not speaking right now. Huh, that's kind of interesting. We, we, we need to remember that. That right now, this is just a dream. That it says that he dreamed another dream and he told it to his brothers and said, oh boy, Joseph, behold, I have dreamed another dream. Imagine what the brothers are thinking when he comes in saying, behold. They probably cringed every time they heard that word, behold. Hene, behold. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Hmm. So not just 11 stars, that's pretty obvious, these brothers, these 11 other brothers, but also the sun. You could assume that that's probably referring to Jacob. And for some reason, Joseph even uh, suggests this moon, which would maybe suggest maybe Rachel. But Rachel's dead right now. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. What's going on with that? Some people say that maybe he had this dream before she died, but that doesn't explain the 11th star, which would be Benjamin. I think at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that this is what causes Jacob to get involved. Because remember, Jacob loves Rachel. <laughs> 
And now this moon, this sun and the moon, this mom and this dad, they are even bowing down to this little boy named Joseph. And suddenly Jacob wants to get involved. Verse 10, it says that when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. The first sin that we've talked about up to this point has been pride, has been arrogance. This way that we just assume that we're better. Or sometimes pride, it has this way of of assuming that everyone needs to fit into what we want and how we want it and when we want it. And when they don't, we just want to get angry. We just want to get bitter. We just want to get frustrated. We want to curse or we want to yell or we want to hit stuff. Or we want to have a pity party. That kind of thing can fester. And it can destroy relationships. It can destroy Bible studies. It can destroy waypoint groups. It can destroy pastors. Those kind of things can just really rot inside God's people because it never just remains pride. It always turns into hate. Uh, It also, hate can sometimes be shown in a form of jealousy. We see that jealousy here happening with Joseph's brothers. But then finally, we have this third sin that I think we need to talk about. And we've already talked about it with Jacob up to this point. And the third sin is going to be apathy. That again, we see Jacob, it's Jacob, it says that he rebuked Joseph, but I believe that rebuke is probably too strong of a translated word here. Uh, it's almost like he scoffed at Joseph. Um, he he, he kind of huffed a little bit. He kind of laughed at him. He kind of rolled his eyes a little bit at, at what Joseph was saying, but he never really corrected Joseph. Have you noticed that Jacob never really seems to truly parent or correct his children? You don't really see him Uh, really trying to correct bad behavior. You think Jacob could say, Joseph, let me tell you, I used to be the younger brother too, and I remember feeling the way that you did about my brother, and let me tell you how that worked out for me. You don't want to go down this route. Jacob could have done that. But just like Isaac, who was apathetic as a father and who was apathetic as a husband, Jacob is doing the same exact thing. This is sad, and it may be a little unpopular, But I am amazed sometimes when we have to pray for people's kids and grandkids who go through terrible things that honestly started 20 years ago. It started 20 years ago. You guys know that better than me because I'm not even a parent. I'm just a kid who used to be alive 20 years ago and I know that there was plenty of things that happened to me that prevented me from going down roads that I could have very easily gone down. Do not be an apathetic parent. I say that just as a kid who has parents. I I just say that as someone who's trying to communicate God's word, do not be an apathetic parent. When your child, when your son or your daughter sins, don't just roll your eyes. Don't just say, oh my goodness, he takes after his mother. Don't just just say, oh, boys will be boys. Don't, don't, Don't just try to laugh it off. Deal with it. Correct it. Confront it. If Jacob had done that, I wonder if this would have happened. Do not be apathetic when it comes to your children. And don't be apathetic when it comes to each other. Be thankful when people love you enough to talk to you about a mistake that you have made in your life. Be thankful when brothers and sisters in Christ are able to confront you and say, hey, you may not see this in your life, but I see this in your life. You may not be focusing on the details of what's creeping into your heart, but this is what I notice, and I want you to be focused on the details. Bless and praise God when that happens. Let's be a kind of church where that happens instead of worrying about hurting people's feelings. Instead of saying, well, if I tell them something, then they're going to unfriend me on Facebook or they're not going to come to church anymore or they're going to say bad things to me to everyone else in some study or some classroom. Let's be courageous in not allowing apathy, not allowing that fear of what other people will think prevent us from loving our brothers and sisters in Christ and our children and our grandchildren to point out those small festering sins that can come up in their life. Do not think that what's happening in the first 11 verses of chapter 37 are just coming out of nowhere. Next week, we're going to have a very tough event that we're going to have to talk about, a very painful, a very tragic thing that's going to happen to Joseph that did not come out of nowhere. 
This is going to be the product of festering sin that does not just happen to Joseph and his brothers, but that has been handed down to them by their father, by their grandfather, by their great-grandfather. This is a pattern of festering sin. So you in your marriage, are you allowing small sins to fester? Here at this church, are we a church where we allow small sins to fester? Where we just, you're like me cleaning up the kitchen. We just, we, we, we breeze over the top stuff and we let everything else just slide. Let's fight for something better. There's a way to do that that is not legalistic. There's a way to say that, hey, yes, like there's sin in my life, but that's okay because God continues to give grace. Let's continue to point to grace, but in order for grace to be effective, grace has to be applied to sin. And we can't forget that part either. These are small festering sins that are happening in Genesis that have been happening for a long time that are about to blow up. I don't want them to blow up in your life. I don't want them to blow up in your family. I don't want them to blow up at this church. Let's attack those small festering sins with God's grace. Let's pray.